At the moment, Ireland is one of the most pluralist and secular populations in the world. Yet we still have officially a very religious society. And the reason for that is that our laws have to catch up with the people and our laws are governed by a constitution that was put in place in 1937 when Ireland was a very Catholic country. So although the Catholic Church doesn't have the control over the people that it used to have, it still has indirect control through laws that were passed when it did have control over the people. Perhaps the most dramatic of those are, are that the Catholic Church still runs 90% of our state-funded primary schools and has exemptions from our equality laws that allow them to lawfully discriminate on the grounds of religion against teachers, pupils and parents. It still runs many of our state-funded hospitals and the government just a couple of weeks ago has planned to give a new 30 million euro national maternity hospital to an order of nuns run by the Catholic Church. And there are a range of other places where our laws don't reflect the pluralism of the Ireland, of the Irish people of the 21st century. Now, one of the most dramatic of those is the Irish blasphemy law. And that came into the news uh, in the last week when Stephen Fry, the English comedian and writer, was uh, investigated for blasphemy by the Irish police. And there was a legal possibility that he might have been fined 25,000 euro and that RTE as the National Broadcasting Authority that broadcast the interview uh, in question could also have been fined. And the background to that is that our constitution has a clause in it saying that blasphemy is a crime which is punishable in accordance with law. And that was incorporated into the Irish law in 1961 as part of the Defamation Act that was passed then. But the only time that it was tested in court, which was after this, a, a divorce referendum that made divorce legal in Ireland, to put it in perspective, by the way, in, in my lifetime, in my early adult lifetime, divorce was unconstitutional in Ireland. Um, homosexuality was illegal. As late as the 1990s, the Virgin Megastore, Richard Branson's brand, was taken to court in Ireland and fined for selling a condom. But the only time that that blasphemy law was tested, the courts found that it wasn't enforceable. And the reason they found it wasn't enforceable was because it didn't define what the offence consisted of. And so we had from then, from the 1990s onward, we had a situation in Ireland where there was a law on the books, but it wasn't enforceable. So in effect, you know, it, 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 for all real purposes, it, it was as if it wasn't there. But then in the uh, early 2000s, the Irish government was updating the Defamation Act in its entirety, within which the blasphemy clause resided. And the Minister for Justice at the time decided, instead of taking that opportunity to remove the blasphemy clause from the, the, the law, decided to make it enforceable by putting in a definition so that it would be enforceable. And he said he was obliged to do that by the Constitution, um, Atheist Ireland lobbied and made various uh, cases that, that, that uh, I won't go into the detail of, but that, that whereas they may have been obliged to have a law, they weren't obliged to have that particular law. We were the first Western democracy to bring in a new blasphemy law in the 21st century. You know, there are a lot of countries that have old blasphemy laws that haven't been enforced, but this one was brought in specifically in order to be enforceable. And we lobbied against it both within uh, Ireland and internationally. Um, Atheist Ireland regularly goes to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, the OSCE, the Council of Europe, all of these bodies that, that are charged with, with uh, examining the human rights records of, of different countries. Whenever Ireland is being questioned, Atheist Ireland goes there and lets the human rights committees know the actual situation on the ground. And it is very useful because the, the UN Human Rights Committees are very different from the UN Human Rights Council. The UN Human Rights Council, which gets a lot of flack, and correctly so, is, is where all the governments basically meet and police, them, police themselves. That's the body that has elected uh, Saudi Arabia to, to a, a committee on, on the rights of women. 
and that there is a very flawed body and a body that needs to be challenged. But the UN Human Rights Committees are different. The committees are independent legal experts who just oversee the treaties, the human rights treaties, and, and examine each country uh, consecutively and say, are you meeting your obligations under the treaty? And our experience of those committees is that they are genuine and that they are objective and, th and that they do try to hold the, the governments to account. So Atheist Ireland has raised the, the blasphemy law with those committees and has got recommendations from those committees to Ireland saying that they breach various human rights. Um, we also lobbied within Ireland, we also, in, in order to show how ridiculous the law is, because it's one of these laws that's quite annoying in that it's both, it's both dangerous and silly. You know, it's, it's dangerous in that it, it um, first of all, it has a silencing effect, even if it, even if it isn't officially enforced. We have had experience of, of na na national and local media self-censoring themselves because they just don't want to get into a legal argument about whether they've committed blasphemy. They're running a business. They're not interested in trying to make political points. So they'll just say, well, if, if there's even any chance of that getting caught up in this blasphemy thing, we're not going to cover it. I've been personally told on, on various live television broadcasts, uh, you know, make sure you don't say anything that breaches the blasphemy law. You know, so, so that, that is one of the, the, the concerns, that, that whether it's enforced or not is beside the point. It has a self-censoring effect on the media. Um, it, uh, but, but it's also very silly, obviously, because it suggests that the creator of the universe needs the Irish Parliament to protect its feelings. And um, <laughs> so one of the things that we did to challenge that is that we, the, the, the Minister for Justice at the time, his name was Dermot Ahern, so we set up a rival church called the, the Church of Dermatology, which worshipped <laughs> Dermot Ahern. And our beliefs included that Dermot Ahern created the world out of nothing, and that ice cream wafers are literally the body of Dermot Ahern. Uh, not just symbolically, that would be a different branch of the church. And we, um, so we, we, would, we used that as, as, as part of, of, of highlighting that we, we said that, that anybody that criticised Dermot Hearn was blaspheming against our church. And so we highlighted the, the silliness of it, but as well as highlighting the silliness of it, it was important to also highlight the dangers of it. And the reason for that is not to do with Ireland. The reason for that is internationally. Is that almost immediately when Ireland passed the, its new blasphemy law, one of the first things that happened at the United Nations is that the Islamic states at the United Nations, led by Pakistan, started citing wording from the Irish blasphemy law as what they wanted implemented internationally to protect religion from defamation. And, the, and they, they, they're delighted to be able to point to Western states that have blasphemy laws, and particularly one that was passing a new blasphemy law in the, um, in the 21st century, to say, look, there's nothing wrong with our blasphemy laws. And what is wrong with their blasphemy laws? They're killing people because of them. You know, in, in, in Pakistan, Asiya Bibi, a Christian woman, is currently facing execution for allegedly blaspheming against Muhammad. And two politicians who spoke out in her favour, the governor of Punjab and, and the minorities minister, one a Muslim and one a Christian, were both murdered. One murdered by his own bodyguard. And when his bodyguard was taken to court for that murder, there were other lawyers throwing rose petals at his feet as he was taken into court. So, so the, the, the difficulty in, these, in, in, in uh, countries like Pakistan and other Islamic countries is not only is, is there no proper due legal process and not only is the, the supposed crime a ridiculous crime in the first place, but you also have just mob rule where people uh, who, who as, as in the case of Asiya Bibi, people who, who uh, have a, um, a row with their neighbours over something and somebody will translate that into an allegation of blasphemy. A mob will gather to threaten to attack the house of the person that's supposed to have committed blasphemy. The police will arrive and instead of dispersing the mob, they will arrest the person who has been accused of blasphemy. And, that's if, and, and so, so if you're lucky, you'll end up like Asiya Baby on death row. And if you're not lucky, you'll end up being lynched before you even get to the police station. Or when you do get to the police station, people dragging you out of the police station and murdering you. So it's such a dangerous situation to be giving any sort of credibility to the idea that blasphemy laws uh, have any justification. And the Irish state knows that it is doing this. We have told the Irish state repeatedly, we've given it the evidence, and it that the successive governments since then have conceded to us that they should remove the clause from the Constitution. But they haven't done it. 
this is another typical Irish thing. They'll say that they're going to do something and then they just never get around to doing it because there's so many different referenda queued up because there's so many problems to, to deal with. So, so what we have in Ireland is now we have a, a law that is silly and silencing and dangerous on the books that everybody acknowledges shouldn't be there but it is still there and the other point that we were constantly making is if it is still there it will eventually be used and when it is used it's going to cause more problems because we'll highlight the problem internationally again it'll give Pakistan and the Islamic States another excuse to reinforce why their blasphemy laws and apostasy laws are okay and we had to give an analogy in Ireland we have another clause in our constitution that, that, that uh, prevents a woman from having an abortion and when, when that clause was put in which was as late as the 1980s it, it was kind of accepted by both sides of the, of the argument that, that, that putting in this so-called pro-life clause into our constitution wouldn't prevent women from going to England for an abortion because that's what typically happened but what happened once that clause came in was in the 1990s there was a raped 14 year old girl who, whose parents were taking her to England for an abortion and they said to the police in Ireland um, we're bringing our, our daughter over to get an, get an abortion, she's been raped, can we use DNA from the fetus to, in a court case to try to, to identify the, the neighbour that they said had, had raped her. And the state's response was now that it's been brought to our attention we're taking out an injunction to prevent that raped teenager from leaving the country it, to, it, because of this pro-life clause. Now that ended up with another change in the law um, but, but it sh what it showed is that once you have a religious law on the books, whether it's in the Constitution or in the laws, once you have any sort of theologically inspired legislation, you'll never know, however improbable it might seem, going back to Robert's probability, tell us the probabilities of it, but however improbable it may, it may seem, you never know when somebody's going to decide that the creator of the universe is telling them that they have to enforce this law. And that's another danger of, of the, these theologically inspired laws, is that you never know when they're going to come at you, even if they seem as if they are an anachronism. And so we come to a couple of weeks ago when, when uh, the, somebody informed the police that Stephen Fry had committed blasphemy. And, what, and, and he had, I mean, even by normal, uh, if there is such a thing, analysis of the idea of blasphemy, all he had done was he was asked in an interview about the meaning of life. He was asked about, his, 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 you know, what would you say if you, if you were wrong and you die and you meet God? And he said, well, I, I would ask him, you know, about bone cancer in children. I would ask him why he's done so, so many things that, that, that are, seem to us to be evil. He, he even prefaced it by saying, well, this is called theodicy. You know, he, it was clear that, that, that he was talking intellectually and, and, and not being um, insulting for the sake of being insulting, even if there was something wrong with that, which, which of course there isn't. But the, the allegation was brought to the attention of the police. The police investigated it, and once the police started investigating it, as, as any sane person would have predicted, it became international news again. And suddenly the Irish blasphemy law was back in the spotlight. Suddenly the Islamic states have another example of, of uh, the Western world acting hypocritically by saying that they're against our blasphemy laws and, and, and look at what they're doing themselves. And so the police eventually dropped the charges after a few days of, of, of just, just ridiculously high profile uh, media on, on it, um, including the... the, the um, the Prime Minister of New Zealand uh, in an interview when it was brought to his attention that uh, New Zealand also has an anachronistic blasphemy law, he said, I didn't even know we had that. So well, we, 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 we'll, be get, we'll be getting rid of that now, uh, now that it's been brought to our attention, thanks to Ireland and Stephen Fry. So I suppose that's one thing that we can be thankful for that Ireland has contributed to is getting rid of the New Zealand blasphemy law. So hopefully we can follow that on by getting rid of ours. But the, the, the big danger of what has happened at the moment in Ireland as well is the reason that the government gave, or not the government, the reason that the police gave for dropping the prosecution, again, or the investigation into Stephen Fry, was they said that according to the law, one of the conditions in the law is that the blasphemy has to cause outrage among a substantial number of adherents of the religion in question. And they said they haven't identified a large number of people 
uh, demonstrating outrage and therefore that they weren't going to be continuing with the investigation. Now that, as we have told the Irish government from the day that that law was passed, and as we, as we had highlighted at, at the UN, at the Council of Europe, at the OSCE, and everywhere else we've been lobbying against this law, that is one of the major dangers of that law, and it's one of the reasons that the Islamic States wanted it as, as, as wording uh, incorporated around the world, is that if you create as one of the tests of whether something is blasphemous, that it creates outrage among a substantial number of adherents of the religion, then what you are doing is you're creating an incentive for people to demonstrate outrage. And that's the last thing that you want to do in a situation like that. We should be encouraging people to react more proportionately when they hear something that goes against their beliefs. Not encouraging them to, to react with outrage. So the next time this happens in Ireland, and we all know uh, how Islamists can react with outrage when they see cartoons and things that, that they find offensive. The next time somebody comes to an Irish police station saying, um, you know, this publication has published a picture of a cartoon, what are the police going to say to them? All they can say is, well, we haven't seen any outrage. You know, which is exactly the last message that you want to send in a situation like that. So we, we have a law that it is absolutely urgent to get rid of. And, uh, and, and we have a government that has already conceded that it should be got rid of, but we need to keep pressure on them to, to, to remove it. And I would encourage everybody here, if you have time with, with your own respective organisations, if you contact us at Atheist Ireland, info at atheist.ie will give you the details, to, to, um, to contact the Irish government yourselves. Because it, this, this is an issue of international pressure. We've already got, had, had a, a, a petition that helped us to get the commitment to remove it in the first place from a number of uh, international advocates and scientists and, and, uh, and, and academics around the world. And, and we'd like to, to do that again for another big push at the moment. So any help that we can get from organisations around the world would be, would be very helpful. Atheist Ireland has an alliance with the Evangelical Alliance of Ireland and the Amadea Muslim Community of Ireland as three groups who have very different worldviews and we, all, we agree that we disagree with each other fundamentally on things, but we are all discriminated against in Ireland uh, by the... the privilege that's given to the Catholic Church by the state. And one of the things that we are doing with that this July, and this is something else that, that, that I will encourage people here to, to get involved in, is uh, Pakistan is, is being questioned this July by the United Nations Human Rights Committee about its human rights record. And obviously there's a lot of people in Pakistan who can't come forward to complain about it because you know, they, they, they will be putting themselves in danger. But Atheist Ireland the Evangelical Alliance of Ireland and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community of Ireland have made a joint submission to the UN Human Rights Committee on behalf of members of our respective belief communities in Pakistan who are persecuted. And we're going to go over collectively as a, as a joint delegation to Geneva when, when the UN is questioning Pakistan to, to highlight that. And, and, and we hope that that, that, that kind of unique alliance of, of three very different worldviews um, highlighting that the, the blasphemy and human rights, other human rights abuses in Pakistan will be useful. As, as, as another thing, by the way, just, I just want to read something very briefly out to you, that Richard Dawkins sent a letter to the Irish Times, um, which was published just two days ago, uh, where he said, Sir, as a gesture of solidarity with Stephen Fry, I quote a sentence from my book, The God Delusion. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Every one of these adjectives is amply documented with full biblical citations in Dan Barker's book, God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. I shall be giving a public lecture in the National Concert Hall, Dublin, on June the 12th and I shall therefore be available for arrest on a charge of blasphemy. Yeah. <laughs>